Hi, my name is Glenn Lowe, and I'm a member of the Carlton 10 a.m. congregation. Today's Bible reading is from 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 to 28. Now, we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all, hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy. I'm one of the senior associate ministers here, and it's a great pleasure to be with you this morning from wherever you're watching. Uh, I don't know about you, but this week has felt a little bit strange for me. The rising COVID cases feel quite discouraging. The response of the public is quite baffling in many ways. The future feels uncertain, and in a very real sense, it was sort of like overnight we all came, became even more dislocated now that we can't see each other's faces as we walk past each other on the street. Uh, Wendy Tui from The Age wrote this week, uh, your brain struggles with the ordinary like its modem is playing up and you're permanently buffering. I really loved that metaphor. I feel like it, it captures how every day we're constantly adjusting to something new, struggling to keep up with the next thing and the impact for today and tomorrow and what happened next. While we wait for Jesus to return and while we wait in this permanently buffering state, one of the blessings that we do have right now is our church family. We've got this community of people who are in this together even though we are apart physically. And we've already seen evidence of that in the interview we just heard with Star, who even from across the world felt the love and support and care of her church family here. Isn't that wonderful? This is going to be an ongoing challenge for us as a church community in the coming months as this permanently buffering state goes on when so many people are feeling really discouraged, how can we keep encouraging each other? And while we wait, how can we remain focused on God? How can we stay together as a community even though we're, we are apart? These are the questions I think we're facing today. And as we come to this last part in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, I hope that we'll find some inspiration to help us strengthen our bonds together as a church family even more. Let me pray for us before we dive in. Faithful, loving God, please open our hearts and minds to hear your words to us today and change us by your spirit. Amen. Now, in, in this last part of Thessalonians, each little section has a common theme that Paul is addressing for their life together as a church. The first concerns their attitude towards leaders, the second, their relationship with each other, and third, how they stay focused on God as a community. Finally, we'll have a look at the prayer that Paul has for them at the end and the wonderful promise and assurance that holds for us as well. On to our first point. While we wait, acknowledge your leaders. 
Have a look with me at verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. So Paul kicks off this list of things by asking them to acknowledge or respect their leaders. And notice here that he doesn't say who they are. There's no names. And he doesn't call them elders or anything like that. They are simply defined by the work, by the ministry that they do among them. They are people who work hard. They put others' needs before their own, caring for them in the Lord. They admonish them as needed. Like any caring person would warn someone to mind the gap at a train station to stop them from falling into danger, so too would their leaders warn or admonish them when their attitude is one of defiance that might disrupt their community or when the behaviour is not in line with what the scriptures say. This warning is given to lovingly correct them. And that's not an easy thing to do for either person to hear or to give, but it should be expected to occur at some stage for we all have occasion to stray, don't we? Remember, all of these things are to build up the other person in faith. They do all of this in the Lord, so it's not for their own gain at all. And that's why Paul asked them to hold them in such high regard, to esteem them in love because of their ministry. He's not telling them to put them on a pedestal and honour them to the point of worship. That's not what he's saying here. Nor should we read into this that they're having any major leadership dramas. This is probably Paul's gentle reminder to them to recognise them for the work that they're doing among them. Remember that their leaders are God's people too. So check in with them. Say thanks to God for them and care for them too as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is followed by a general command to live in peace with each other. Now, I feel a little bit awkward applying this as one of the leaders here at St Jude's, but please know that I'm not tooting my own horn at all. I think one of the takeaways for us here today is to, is to actually check in with your leaders. Your pastors here are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ as are our parish councillors and wardens, our small group leaders, our children's and youth leaders, and everything in between. We are all leading in extraordinarily difficult times. It's so complex. The landscape we're working in is constantly changing, and how we do ministry has dramatically changed even while our mission has not. So please be praying for us. As a church family, we care for each other. We're we're helping people uh, through their anxiety and disappointment whilst managing our own. So how can you show love and care and respect for your leaders who in love are working hard to care for you and admonish you even through these changing times? In all of these things, I particularly encourage you to be praying for peace to be felt and known and experienced by everyone in this season. I know I I personally am deeply thankful for those of you who've been reaching out to me and offering encouragement, and I felt lifted up in prayer, particularly this week, so thank you, and keep doing that for all your leaders. Our second point, while we wait, encourage each other. Paul now turns to their own relationships, urging them to take responsibility for warning, encouraging, and helping each other in their community. Have a look at verse 14. He says, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other, and for everyone else. Now, the word for idleness here is described not so much as an idea of laziness, but more as a stronger sense of disruption, which is why there's idle and disruptive here. So there might have been people uh, in the Thessalonian church who were really fixated on the second coming of Jesus, so much so that they were disrupting the normal um, state of peace in their community. So it was up to everyone to warn them about what's going on in love. 
And then there might have been those who were really disheartened, waiting for the return of Jesus and not knowing when that would happen might cause them a lot of anxiety and for some even cause their faith to falter. And so those people needed encouragement. And then there's the weak, those who might be sick physically, mentally or spiritually. Help those people who are struggling. And be patient with all these people. Be patient with those who are disrupting the community, with those you're supporting and who are taking a little more effort and energy than usual. And be patient with the weak and be patient with everyone around you. And how relevant are these things to us today, right? There are so many people who are really disheartened right now in our church community and also in our wider community. So how could you reach out to them? How could you encourage someone else? I wonder if you could write a card or start a pen pal with someone. Could you order some baked goods and have them delivered to a friend or pick up the phone or write a text, say, hi, I'm thinking of you and praying for you. Those simple words go such a long way to helping someone feel like they're not alone when they're surrounded by the same four walls. And think particularly of those in our church family who are living alone at the moment. They're, they'll feel this more acutely than most. And who are the weak that you know? Someone who's sick or struggling with poor mental health or wavering in their faith? What word from the scriptures could you give them? Could you order some groceries to deliver them? Could you go for a walk in your suburb and them in theirs and talk on the phone while you do that? And how are you going with patience? That's a practice of bearing with each other every day, isn't it? Bearing with our faults and mistakes, that one little thing that annoys us about the other person we're living with. Bearing with our colleagues when everyone is under incredible stress and not necessarily acting as they normally would. That includes the people we live with, even when your kids interrupt your work day or when you're having a bad housemate day. It means being patient with our political leaders who are making the best decisions they can with the information that they have. This week, it took all my self-control not to yell at the person in the supermarket wearing a mask but not covering their nose. Like, hello, did you, get, did you miss the memo? Right? Patience, right? It's something that we're all working on on a daily basis. And this patience helps us to be at peace with each other. It means not paying back wrong for wrong, but instead striving, that is seeking out the good for the other person, for everyone. I think another way of thinking about this is how could you be a blessing for someone else? And one family's way of helping their kids think about this has, uh, during lockdown has been to make cards and give them away. They, the cards that they have been making sit on top of their letterbox with a little sign that says, please take these homemade cards and keep in touch with your loved ones. And people have actually been taking them. How good is that? They've given away 25 cards already. And to quote them, we're feeling grateful that God has given us this chance to put a little good into the world in this rough time. How could you do something like that? Seek the good for someone else. I think we can't underestimate the power of a good deed to encourage our church family and our wider community in these times when so many are disheartened. Those seemingly small acts of kindness can become that one bright spot in a person's day. And it's such a powerful witness that God is still working even now. So who is that person that God is calling you to encourage this week? And how are you going to do that? So far we've looked at, one, while we wait, acknowledge your leaders. Two, while we wait, encourage each other. And now we're going to turn to our third point. While we wait, stay focused on God. Read with me verse 16. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
Now, these words are such a great reminder for the Thessalonian church and for us to stay focused on God together in prayer. Rejoice always, Paul says. Now, remember, the Thessalonians have been experiencing some suffering, and so it might not seem particularly pastorally sensitive for Paul to say, rejoice always right now. But remember, Paul has this gift of being able to see the immense work of God in their lives through the gospel and through the work of the Spirit. And that's why he continually rejoices. And he wants them to have that same perspective, to lift their gaze to what God is doing in their church, in each person, despite the suffering they're experiencing, and to rejoice in that. Now, I don't think that means to ignore the suffering or to like slap on a happy face when that's clearly not the case. There's nothing authentic about that. But it does mean that they won't give up meeting together to worship Christ and rejoice in what he has done for them. So if someone had told me a couple of weeks ago, rejoice always, they would not have got a very good response from me. But... I didn't give up meeting with my church family despite the sadness I was feeling. There is joy that can be found in gathering together knowing that someone else in another lounge room is also watching the same thing as me, saying the same words, singing the same songs and giving glory to our Heavenly Father together. There is unity in the spirit knowing my brothers and sisters in Christ are in this with me together. That helps raise our perspective to see what God is doing among us. It enables us to rejoice in the good news of Jesus and the reason why we gather. Pray continually, Paul says. We are God's children and wholly dependent on him. And in Luke 18, Jesus tells his disciples a parable about a widow who's seeking justice from a judge, and she goes to him again and again and again seeking justice, and each time he says no. She keeps going back. She's so persistent. And eventually this judge says, yes, okay, I'll give you justice. And Jesus tells that story to make sure his disciples know never to stop praying. You can always come to God and he will hear you. Don't give up praying. For us, don't give up praying that Jesus might return quickly. Don't give up praying for God to slow the spread of this virus. Don't give up praying for a vaccine. Don't give up praying for our country and its leaders, or our church or your faith or your families. Don't give up. Keep praying to our Heavenly Father who listens and who hears and who answers you. Give thanks in all circumstances, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of a pandemic. God is still at work here. So look for the blessings. Look for the things to be grateful for, See if you can't find three things each day this week to thank God for each day. Actually write them down and then pray them back to God. Then text them to someone else and encourage them for how God has been working in your life. What a great way to help us stay focused on God. Each of these things will help us lift our gaze to him and focus on him. They are the will of Christ, whose death means that we now have the immense privilege of speaking to God, our Father, directly. So keep praying. And be open to the Spirit's work in your life and in our church in this time. In verse 19, Paul says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. So like you would pour water onto a campfire to put it out, Paul is saying, don't stop the spirit. But hang on, isn't the spirit God? So we can't stop him from working, right? This is true. But it seems that some in the Thessalonian church were rejecting all prophecies, including some spirit-inspired ones. Now, what's the problem with this? 
Uh, well, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul identifies prophecy as one of the gifts of the Spirit. So their purpose is to build up and encourage the church. And these prophecies post-Jesus don't replace the scriptures at all. They're generally more about ways to live in light of the scriptures today. And with this in mind, they should be tested. <clears throat> so say some self-proclaimed prophets um, say something about Jesus coming back next year, for example, and uh, you should all bunker down for the grand apocalypse. Now, we know that's wrong because we can see, check it in the Bible, which actually says we don't know the exact time and date of Jesus' return, only that he will. And that's actually the most important thing. Instead, you might have someone else come and give you examples of how you might live while you wait for Jesus to return. And you can check if those examples line up with what the Bible says. And that kind of thing might be more useful for building up and encouraging the church. So this was an issue for the Thessalonians. And as you can imagine, some were beginning to treat all of the prophecies with contempt and be at risk of rejecting the good things that were coming from the work of the Spirit. So Paul gives them some qualifications for checking the prophecy in their church community. He says to test them. So listen to what you hear from the people and test them against what you know from the gospel foundations and the scriptures. Hold on to the good things that they say and reject what's bad. It's like eating a grape that has a seed in it. You pop the whole thing in your mouth, realise there's a seed inside, and you spit the bad bit out. You accept what's good, and you reject what is evil. These are, of course, good principles for testing the words of a preacher, too. So always, can I encourage you always to have your Bible open uh, with you when you're listening so you can read it and check what we're saying is true. Now, as I've been reflecting on this passage this week and this idea of stopping the work of the Spirit, I've wondered how this might apply to us today. And I wonder if, in our situation, some of us might be tempted to forget that God is still at work in the midst of a pandemic. I wonder if we're tempted to close the Bible and ignore God because we're angry or sad at what we see around us. I wonder if we'd be tempted to um, shut our eyes to the work of the Spirit in our everyday lives just because we want things to go back to what they were before. But what if God is working in ways far beyond our comprehension? I wonder what our church would look like in the future if, right now, if every parent began reading Bible stories that tell of God's love for their children and the world every night. And if before they sent their kids to bed, they prayed for them and with them. And what if our teenagers took up the challenge of reading the Bible each week and praying for God to speak to them? How would the Spirit transform them? What kind of leaders would he be forming them into now and for the future of the church? And what if we did that? What if, what if we use this time to develop new habits of rest, using this time away from the hurried life and instead carved out some quiet time, like actual silence, which is difficult, I know, but to actually listen to God? And what if we learn to appreciate the simple things in life and thank God for the blessings that he's already given us? What if we picked up the phone more to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ and and our friendships actually grew stronger? What if he's shaking up the church so much that we rethink the way we do things to reach more people with the gospel? What if God is moving in ways far beyond our comprehension right now? I wonder, are we really open to the Spirit truly using this time to transform us? As we move from one lockdown to another and each time something peripheral is stripped away from our lives, what are we left with for the Spirit to do his work when all the distractions are gone? It might be painful to reflect that deeply, 
to be open to the Spirit to change you to be more like Jesus, but it will be one of the most valuable things you can do at this time while we wait. So while we wait, stay focused on God, keep praying, and be open to the Spirit. And that brings us to our final point. While we wait, remember God's promise and trust him. While this list of Paul's might feel a little bit overwhelming, this final prayer holds words of such comfort and assurance for the church that he wrote this to, but also for us. Because checking this list off one by one doesn't make you blameless before God. No, God is the one who actually does that for us. This is his promise and assurance. It's this grace through Jesus that Paul ends his letter with. In verse 23, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. Paul prays to the God of peace, of shalom, of wholeness. This is the God who, through the death and resurrection of his son, has made you whole again, at peace with him. This is the God who doesn't abandon you, but keeps working in you, sanctifying you, transforming you to be more like Jesus, completely and wholly. And this is so that you'll be kept blameless on that last day when Jesus does return. On that day, you'll stand before this God of peace and he will see someone whose life is blameless because Jesus has kept you so by his spirit. God is faithful. He's already called the Thessalonians to be his children and he's done that for us as well. We're his children, we are his church. And God is faithful. He will do what he says. He will sanctify us, and he already is by the work of his spirit. So we can trust him. He's still there. He hasn't left us. So while we wait in this permanently buffering state, and while we wait for Jesus to come back, acknowledge the hard work of your leaders and pray for them. While we wait, encourage the disheartened and help those who need it. While we wait, stay focused on God. Don't give up praying to him and stay open to the spirit transforming you in a new way. And while we wait, remember God's promise to sanctify you and keep you blameless for the day of the Lord. Remember that God is faithful. You can trust him. He will do this. And it is all through Christ in us by his spirit that this happens. So I'm going to invite you now to keep reflecting on this and respond by singing together the words of our next song. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.